big problems with our heuristics and how we solve problems is a lot of our cognitive biases. As humans, we're very fallible to making shortcuts that sometimes work, but sometimes don't work. So some of the things that sometimes don't work are the anchoring, confirmation, hindsight, representative, and availability biases. This is where this unit sort of crosses over with philosophy or the study of logic, but let's get into it. So an anchoring bias is the idea that when you're trying to solve a problem, you're hyper-focused on some details that don't matter as much as you think they do. You're blindsided to the bigger picture. If you've ever been in an escape room and you're trying to look for clues, you might have found yourself totally hung up on this one panel on the side that looks suspicious, but it's actually just decorative and not part of the game. This is the idea that you're anchored in this one point and you're putting all this energy here when it's really not the purpose. So this is an anchoring bias. So when you're trying to solve problems, it's when you get stuck on a red herring or when, when something is just distracting you and it shouldn't be. The next one is the confirmation bias. This is the idea that you're focusing on what matches your assumption, but ignoring and disregarding information that actually disrupts your assumption. And so you're only looking for information that confirms your beliefs. This has been a well-documented cognitive bias, especially in the years of social media. We know that people tend to look at the news and read newspapers and look at TV channels that match their biases. And now social media, we can curate that even more. If you go and Google something and you're trying to get an impartial result, it's actually usually not impartial. It can be influenced by your Google history and even influenced by the exact word or phrase you search. For example, if you search something like vaccine autism, you might actually get results saying that vaccines do cause autism. Versus if you search vaccine safe, you might get a list of findings to say vaccines are totally safe. So it's very scary in the world today that our artificial intelligence also displays this confirmation bias or cognitive bias. So how do we get around it? It also can be really dangerous for us to start to let in hateful and hurtful information, information that goes against good science. So where do we find the balance? Well, one of the things we have to do is to be aware when we're looking at well-reputed sources, are we ignoring some of the things those well-reputed sources are saying? Are we disregarding it because it doesn't map onto what we expense? This is the idea that when we're reading about good science and some of it bothers us and we want to reject it, accept that you have that emotional reaction to it. We're humans, we have limbic systems, it's okay. And acknowledge that it's hard to accept stuff, but you're gonna work on it. This is something that all of us do as humans. If somebody challenges our beliefs and it's something that we're really emotionally tied to, we tend to dig our heels in and not be ready to accept the difference. And so just be aware that you have that emotional reaction to this cognitive thing. Our emotions and cognitions are tied together. A third type of bias is the hindsight bias. This is the idea that after an event has occurred, you feel like you should have known that before it happened. It's the idea if you make this really big mistake and it's really tragic, you say, oh, I should have known better. But you couldn't have known better. You didn't know better. You, you can't blame yourself for it. Let's say you go to an escape room and you totally fail and you don't win on time. And afterwards, the people running the business that come out and they show you where the triggers and the alarms were and all the stuff you missed. And you're like, oh, I totally knew that. Or, oh, I was this close. You weren't actually this close. You're just saying that to make yourself feel better. This is the idea that if something really bad happens, we tend to blame ourselves or feel that we're responsible for it when really the event was actually really unpredictable. A fourth type of bias is the representative bias. This has to go with how we build our schemas and how the concepts fit within our schemas. And this is the idea that we try and think as efficiently as we can and we take lots of shortcuts. And one type of shortcut we tend to take cognitively is stereotyping. This is the idea that if you know that a few people are cowboys who live in Calgary, you tend to assume that everybody who lives in Calgary loves dressing up like a cowboy in the summer. And although Calgary Stampede is really popular, not everybody in Calgary actually dresses up like a cowboy. Not everybody in Calgary works in oil and gas, for instance, even though it's pretty popular. It'd be the same thing if you thought that everybody from Nova Scotia was a sailor or a pirate. Though there is a lot of sailors in my family tree, we are not all sailors. It's like saying that all Canadians can skate. We know not all Canadians can skate. Now this works hand in hand with our confirmation bias. If you find a few Calgarians who are cowboys or a few Nova Scotians who are sailors, you may say, aha, I knew it, they were all that way. And if you find ones that don't, 
you tend to assume they're the exception to the rule and that your stereotype still works. So stereotyping is something our brain is hardwired to do, but can lead us astray. We can end up thinking something that's totally fabricated. And it can be even worse if that's discriminatory and prejudiced. And the final one we're gonna talk about is the availability bias. This is the idea that we tend to grasp on information that is more readily available to us. This is like a sample bias we talked about in unit two. If you're trying to do a study and you only take the people that are more easily to obtain, you might be getting a sample bias in that the people who participate in your study might be different than the general population. We also might find that if you're using a lot of your personal experience, your personal experience is not the same as doing scientific research. Anecdotal research, that is your personal experiences, may not generalize to the everyday population and may not reflect something that's inherently true. It's the idea that if you go to Nova Scotia once and it stinks and smells like seaweed and seems disgusting, you might think that it's always a smelly place. And that just happened to be you went at low tide. Maybe you need to go on other days and in other seasons. So it's the idea that what is in your personal narrative, what's in your personal diary, may not reflect those larger truths. Now, when we're thinking about problems and we're thinking about solutions to those problems, it's important to understand that humans are not alone in these endeavors. For instance, we know that animals have learned to conquer very complex problems. We've talked before about how animals can be trained to play ping pong and to press levers. Think about a working dog who either is a police search dog or a guide dog. We also know about monkeys who have been trained to use vending machines, for instance. Now that may come down to just behaviorism and conditioning, but animals have also been found to solve really complex novel problems with no conditioning. One of my favorite examples is from the book Gifts of the Crow by John Marsluff. Highly recommend the book if you're interested. It's the idea that crows were able to solve really complicated issues. In one example, there was a hard wooden board that was heavy, that couldn't be flipped. And on this wooden board, they attached a clear tube. And the tube was of the certain diameter that they couldn't really get their beaks or head down it very far. In the tube, they placed some food. And I think it was a little basket of food, actually. So they placed a little basket of food, and then there was a thin metal wire. So there was a clear tube with a basket of food, a metal wire, and a wooden board. And the crows, which are related to magpies and ravens, all very smart species of birds, the crows were given access to this apparatus to try and figure out if they could get the food out. And they could, but they tried a couple things. So first they, they did a couple trial and error, but it wasn't completely fully random. They were using a bit of a heuristic here and figuring out what they could do. The first thing most of the crows tried was to tip over the tube, but it couldn't. The wood was so heavy, the wood wouldn't tip over and the clear tube was attached to the wood. The next thing they often tried to do was to chew at the clear tube and to see if they could break it, and they couldn't. The third thing they would choose to do was to take the metal wire and spear the basket of food. That was usually unsuccessful. The fourth thing that most of them tried to do was then to take the metal wire and use it to kind of scrape the basket up the side of the plastic tube. That was usually unsuccessful. And 100% of the crows eventually made it to the stage where they learned to bend the wooden wire into the shape of a J and then use that J-shaped hook to pick up the basket. Pretty impressive, with no prior teaching, no vicarious learning, they were able to deduce this. Just a little snippet of how smart some animals can be with their problem-solving skills.